it is, but we call the 10 key performance indicators for a successful transition program. We're pleased to be part of your 2017 Green Mountain Dairy School. Daniel uh, is going to take any questions that come in. Uh, he will just jump in and we'll answer those questions on the fly and we will get down and with, we should have about three or four minutes to spare when I timed her out last night. The picture you're seeing there is this is our University of Illinois dairy farm and we are milking about uh, 130 cows there. It should be 225 and that's another story for another time. If you go north of here is our vet school and a mile north of there, this is north, there would be our University of Illinois campus. So we're going to be off and running. Well, certainly a lot of change is happening in the transition cow feeding programs, and it's kind of kind of a gray area. There's a lot of opinions out there, so let's uh, talk about how this changed and what's going on. I think uh, this is kind of neat. Most of you probably read this in your, in your last issues of dairy magazines, but here is the new world record cow, and that is the actual cow picture there, my evergreen, my view, my gold, ET, and she produced a mere 77,000 pounds of milk, which is about three times the national average for Holstein animal as far as that goes. The amazing thing is this cow is a daughter of the former record cow. So pretty good genetic, genetics there in that herd in Wisconsin. Waldo is near Lake Michigan, uh, just south of Green Bay if they want to know where Waldo, Wisconsin is. Of course, we also have other changes going on. I thought this would be a very popular PowerPoint in Vermont. I guess I was surprised. We didn't realize that uh, the Senator Sanders was, was promising two pounds more milk if he was elected president. And that's what the figure two really means there. So I thought for sure that uh, the Wisconsin uh, dairy farmers would have backed him a lot more than what they did as far as that goes. But you know, guys and gals, change happens. And so we changed here at the University of Illinois. And so we now have President uh, Trump's look both uh, myself and our Jersey cattle. So we kind of have the, uh, the, the Trump look, as we would say. That's supposed to be funny. I won't ask for any applause. We will move on. Well, really, the, the question we have on today's webinar is, how do we help this cow? As we can see, she's just delivered a live calf. She's cleaning the calf up. Looks like she's going to be a pretty good cow. And of course, the question is, how do we help her make this smooth transition from a dry cow to a fresh cow to a high producing cow and make us lots and lots of money. What are the problems and concerns? Well, this is the term I like to use. I call them broken cows. Broken cows are cows that basically leave the herd before they complete the lactation and they are a huge financial loss for two reasons. First of all, I lose the cow and I lose the, the value of that cow. A good cow probably, the picture we saw there is probably worth somewhere around $3,000. She's a really good looking registered cow. We also lose the milk in that lactation. So broken cows leave the herd uh, basically in the first 60 days after calving. More about that in just a minute. Number two, transition cows are high-risk cows because their immune system is depressed, dry matter intakes drop, hormonal changes are happening, and of course that can lead to metabolic disorders which can be very expensive and very deadly as we go through the program. This is a Cornell slide that came from the vet school at Cornell University. Uh, it's got some years on it, but the key is uh, uh, notice uh, over 5,000 herds and 61,000 cows. And you see all these beautiful arrows that Jim really fancied up for us. And so you can see uh, here, we are in the middle, we got, and the study was based on ketosis. But you can see all the factors that can, all the arrows coming into ketosis. So it's multi-factored as far as that goes. You can also see uh, arrows going away from ketosis. For example, here's amylasal disorders that can occur as well. So certainly, uh, you, the bottom line is <clears throat> you don't want to be on the slide. You don't want your cows on the slide. And how can we come through our 10 key indicators that probably reduces some of these risks and what the prevalence are going to be? A lot of choices, Daniel, and, and students out there or attendees on our webinars here today. Uh, I'm not going to walk you through them, but you go through Horde's Dairyman, Progressive Dairyman, dairy, uh, dairy Herd Management. You'll see articles, all these things saying this is the way to go. And so we're going to have our biases uh, as well. Certainly, you're going to see us here bias on the bottom. We think the, the, the high straw diet has worked very well here in the U.S. You're also going to see us uh, looking at a two-group system close up and far off dry cows. We think that's probably the better alternative on most dairy farms <clears throat> because we can help meet the cow's requirements as she gets very heavy with calf and starts producing colostrum. And here's another list that you can go through as well. Uh, we'll touch on drenching here a bit later. We'll touch on anionic products as well. And of course, feed additives. So certainly we're gonna touch on many of these points and we'll let you be the judge. We'll let you make that decision on where we're gonna go. So that's kind of the setup. We're saying, how do we help 
this cow transition? How do we avoid broken cows? How do we keep them off the metabolic disaster PowerPoint from the Cornell University? And so Jim Boltz and I came up with something that I, I call KPIs. In fact, I actually borrowed from a Canadian colleague at a meeting in a different way. And KPI stands for Key Performance Indicators. And so it says, what can you go home to your dairy farm or work with your, uh, your uh, clients in the county or if you're a veterinarian uh, there or a feed, feed, ha feed handler uh, to your, 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 your people that you serve there, what are some of the things that you can take home, the, home with to them to say if in fact they're doing a good job in transition management? So we we're gonna ask the question and uh, the question is, what is a KPI? And by definition, it's a specific, measurable, and controllable performance indicator that allows you to predict and prevent a potential problems. So these are basically specific, useful, measurable, and controllable. And so this is a fun list, and maybe we'll have to expand that list as we go on. Jim Balls put this together. It's a little bit like driving a car. And all of us have these gauges on our car, and some of them have colors associated with them. But you can say here's a, here's a KPI uh, for a herd which is 123 days of milk with a 57 average days dry. Uh, a warning light over here says uh, beta hydroxybutyric acid on the high side. You can see on the feed bunk, it's not quite full. You can see milk production, dry matter intake. And over here, you can see basically a temperature gauge as well. So certainly kind of a neat visual that says these are the gauges that you and I are going to be looking at. So here we go. And Daniel, don't be afraid to jump in with any questions or I'll take a breath here, here as we go along as well. So you're gonna see 10 numbers pop up here in the next 40 minutes and we'll stay right on schedule. <clears throat> KPI number one, that is the number of cull cows before there are 60 days in milk. And the guideline is to be under 8%. Now, Dairyman, you can do this right now. Take out your DHI records or your, your dairy comp records for 2016 and see how many cows you culled. Let's say I had a 100 cow dairy farm. I may have culled 30 cows. So the question of those 30 cows you culled in 2016 were uh, less than three of them under 60 days in milk. You say, well, that doesn't happen. This is an older data set, it's been updated. Uh, there's a data set in Georgia and Florida also as well. This simply shows DHI records from the University of Minnesota, uh, six, nearly 6,000 herds and nearly 625,000 cows. And the bar says how many cows were culled in the first 20 days, 11%. Then in the next 21 days, from 20 to 41, another 8%. Then you come down here to 60. So if you add these all up, you can see 11 and eight and five, and there's 24%. That's a big number. That 8% number comes from Gordy Jones. Some of you will recognize that name. He does a lot of speaking here in the US. So you can see a, a, the a number of cows leaving. Here is your other ones, the percent leaving the herd. And of course you can see the, 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 they go down here. The, the black line, take home message. What are the two biggest risks for cows leaving the herd? Transition health and not getting cows pregnant. And so if you can solve those two events on your farm, then the, the black line becomes your friend. Well, that's KPI number one. Daniel, any questions or comments? We're 10 minutes in. Does that include dead cows? Yeah, does that include dead cows? Yes, it does. In fact, that's primarily dead cows. Heavily, many of those are dead cows, cows that may have had severe mastitis, cows that have a red metabolic death, but yes, they are, they are dead cows. Dead cows are part of that. The number I saw from the, late, the, late, the latest, latest uh, study from the USDA is somewhere around 7% is a normal figure. And of course, that's an important question. When do those 7% die? Are they in that, in that window as well? And the other big loss you're gonna have there is if some of those, and we were on one farm in which half of those cows that died in the first 60 days were first calf heifers. So now I've lost that genetics in that herd, plus I've lost two and a half, three lactations on top of it. Pretty expensive. Okay, hearing all the comments, we'll move on to KPI number two. KPI number two is what is the dry matter intake in close-up pens? Now, for some of us, we may not have a close-up pen, so uh, this is gonna be a tougher KPI, you can't use it. Not everybody can use all 10 of the KPIs. So if we got a close-up pen, 21 days before calving, I would like to have my mature cows eating 30 pounds of dry matter in a close-up pen, and the high straw diet really favors that, by the way. If I've got a springy heifer pen, 
meaning getting rid of calf the first time, that should be 25 pounds. In Illinois, in many cases, that's a mixed pen. In other words, we have one pen of far off dry offs and one pen of close ups. And of course, the heifers are mixed in there at the same time. If you could average 27, 28, you're really doing pretty good. That's a very dynamic pen. Notice, so we'll probably sometimes be putting two cows in and the three cows calf. And so in a matter of a day or two, uh, that the numbers can really jump around. And of course, days in pen, that's going to be important as well. That has to be at least 10 heifers, cows have to be in the close-up pen for at least 10 days. Otherwise, you are really setting them up for a problem as well. This is some work on the University of uh, Wisconsin. And what you're doing, this is uh, dry matter intake before calving. Prepartum is the term uh, scientists use, I tend to say before calving. And so you can see when I get here to 28 pounds of dry matter, that's kind of our mixed pen average. You then look to see what is the dry matter intake after calving. And you can see a very interesting relationship. Yeah, there's a lot of scatter there, but you can basically see higher dry matter intakes before calving favor high dry matter intakes after calving. And we know with the kinds of cows that we're milking in Vermont now and here in Illinois, dry matter intake is kind of uh, really rules as far as that goes. So then we then go to the next step and say, okay, now let's take a look at postpartum dry matter. And not a big surprise here at all. That this is pretty straightforward. Every one of these are different studies, every one of those diamonds in both of these slides. And now you look at milk production. And now my dairy farmers really sit up and listen. She or he says, wow, it says if I can get in the first three weeks after calving, if I can average 42 pounds of dry matter, it means those cows should be able to support 90 pounds of milk. And look at the R squared for you statisticians. The last one we didn't put up there because it's not very high. R squared simply says that 78% of the milk production response in these studies can be explained by dry matter intake. So it's a real driver, no question about that. So let's then introduce the high straw diet. Dr. Jim Drakeley was one of the lead uh, researchers here along with some other universities around the world doing some work here. Dr. Drakeley estimates about a third of the cows, not the herds, a third of the cows, because large herds really like this program, tend to be in what we call the high straw, low energy dry cow program that was developed and championed here at the University of Illinois. So what's the theory? Well, the theory is not too much energy or dry matter, or energy, excuse me, I'll get it right, not too little, but just the right amount. And so the goal is to be around 100%, and sometimes people call that the Goldilocks diet because, you know, Goldilocks laid in three beds and one was too hard, one was too soft, and one was just right. Dr. Drakeley looks at this for heifers and cows, 13 to 16 mcals. I actually will bump this up to about 14 and 18, if you want to know the truth. More about that in just a minute. So consistency. Now this is the high straw diet, and what's the bad news? Well, it's going to be very sortable. You can already see there are there are some silages not blended in very well, and you can see very long pieces. So this is a bad one. Don't you try? Don't you make it look like this at all? Anything over two inches, they're going to sort, and you got to add water to it to be sure that they cannot uh, they find the straw a little more palatable. Here is your diet. I'm not going to walk you through it. Here is your straw high, high straw diet. This is your high energy diet. This would be a, a typical close up dry cow type ration over here. So you can see, if you look at this, a lot more corn grain sitting in this diet here. Here you can see about a third of the dry matter is wheat straw and a third of it is corn side. That corn side is pretty important. Maybe in Vermont, you don't have the access of corn side for dry cows, but that corn side brings the starch, brings the palatability, and rumen stimulation. That's really, really important. And that's gonna be kernel processed, by the way, also, to make sure the corn is available down here. Then you can come through here, and you're gonna see this is heat treated. This is our RUP, rumen degraded protein there. There is some urea in there, why? Because I need urea to get some soluble protein that the wheat straw is missing out on. So I've gotta make sure this is a balanced diet. We'll give you those specs here in just a minute. So these diets look vastly different. We look at corn and wheat straw and alfalfa as far as that goes. And that alfalfa is gonna be important. We look at DCAD here in just a few minutes. Here's the research and you may have to come back and study it. Uh, Jim has got about seven of these different studies here. Uh, we got uh, the, the green one is a high straw diet. And what you should notice is a very consistent dry matter intake. 
the red one is the high the high energy diet. This is 150 percent, 140 percent of the cow's requirement. So you can see they eat more of it, therefore they get heavier. And then you can see about uh, two weeks before calving, they really drop in dry matter intake. And we think that's the real risk coming with these types of diet. What is the orange one? The orange one is a restricted intake. So we took the red one and we said we're going to feed 1% of body weight. And so these cows are always hungry and they really, really eat feed. The interesting thing is the energy intake of the 1% and the green one are about the same. Then you come over here and you look after calving and you can see why there is pretty nice separation here as far as percent of body weight. It is not statistically significant. You know, that's just one small study. I think we put all his studies together, we may see a trend, but you can see the nice, the first three or four weeks after calving, these lines stay pretty far apart and then they start coming together here a bit later in the lactation. So certainly an important uh, driver as well. So we take a look at fat accumulation in the liver. And here you can see these are the overfed cows, probably reflecting uh, the heaviness of the cow and their fat mobilization. 10 days after calving, you can see that the two restricted energy or lower energy diets, very nice. What's the magic number? According to Michigan State Crooks, it's about 10%. Once you get about 10% liver lipid in the liver, boy, that's a tricky one to say, uh, it may be irreversible and the cows then will be suffering ketosis and other metabolic challenges. So we can really change the liver as far as that goes. And yes, these cows figured it out. Uh, this is the level of beta hydroxy butyric acid. That's one of the blood ketone bodies. And you can see a spiking that occurs here. And if we draw the line in here, this is 1.4 uh, or millimolars per, or uh, 14 milligrams per deciliter. That's the action point for subclinical ketosis. And you can see these cows are very, very close to it. These cows are very, very healthy and they stay modestly low. All cows are probably going to have some increase in beta hydroxybutyric acid because of fat mobilization in the first 30 or 40 days after calving. You can see again. And of course, the real secret is how quickly do your cows drop this and come back to the baseline. And that and uh, Michigan State calls that, and this number is, if it takes too long, it's defined as days in the vet clinic, <clears throat> excuse me, at Michigan State University. So, and that, by the way, was statistically significant at the 0.05 level. What does that mean? It says that 95% of the time, this is gonna happen on your farm, these curves, depending on which curve you're on. So what's the magic of the wheat straw? We saw the dye sitting somewhere around nine or 10 pounds of straw. It is uh, with, along with processed corn silage and a balancer and you must, you must add water. You must add water. We wanna soften the straw up, reduces particle size. Notice bullet point number two, nothing longer than two inches in length. Most farmers are using a tub grinder. One of our big uh, dairymen here in Illinois use a triple screw vertical mixer. And every Thursday he grinds uh, the straw and he knows if you run it for 26 minutes, he gets the particle size he wants. He then runs it out and then he makes his dry cow rations as a, uh, basically as a, as a commodity or as a pre-processed forage ready to go in. Make sure it's clean, uh, no mold, because sometimes straw gets to lay out in the fields here in the Midwest and gets washed and therefore mold developments here. The power of the straw is it floats in the rumen, hangs around for two or three days. Uh, the cows must find it palatable. And what will we do? We maintain rumen fill. So that last day of calving or the day of calving when cows eat a lot less feed, if any at all, your straw is still sitting in there and that favors the cow to maintain rumen fill, rumination, and reduce DAs as far as that goes. And of course, the word our farmers tell us is these cows are very aggressive eaters after calving, and really they eat as much as they can. The straw limits the dry matter intake, so it's kind of a fill factor as well. So here are your nutrient guidelines. I'm not going to read these to you. Uh, Dr. Drakeley provides them. So if you've got your ration right, your nutritionist, your veterinarian, your consultant, here are the numbers that he's looking for. This is an important one. You must have a program that has a metabolizable model in it. Because remember, straw is not a friend of the rumen microbes. Uh, they don't get very happy. They're not clapping when they see straw coming in there because that's not very digestible. And so that number is over, actually the newest number now is 1,200. This was his earlier slide. The new number is 
100 grams for cows. Heifers will be slightly lower, but not very much. But you want these cows delivering about 1,200 grams of metabolizable protein. And that's why the Soy Plus was in there. That's why the corn size is in there with urea is to drive microbial protein. Here comes your trace minerals, pretty straightforward. Um, in many cases, you will have some type of a DCAD product in there, animate, uh, soy chlor, biochlor, or some type of anionic salt over there as well to get the job done. And we would like to have Drakeley, Dr. Drakeley has 1,500. We would have 2,000 IUs of vitamin E in the program because the colostrum is going to be pulling some of the vitamin E out of the bloodstream and uh, lowering the level that's circulating. That's KPI number two. Daniel, any questions? Nope, not right now. Thank you. Let's go on. KPI number three. We'll stop every after every KPI unless we get running short on time. KPI number three is certainly a, a, a critical one. It simply says every farmer in Illinois and Vermont, and I got a feeling they don't do this, should be able to tell you, Daniel, what is the percent milk fever, ketosis, DA, and retained placenta. These would be our guidelines. One farmer was critical. He said, oh, that's too high. should be 3%. Hooray for you. Set your targets. What should your targets be? I don't disagree. Most of these are national figures here as far as that goes. And so what is the prevalence of metabolic disorders? It's a great roadmap. When these numbers start going up, look out. Something's going wrong in your transition program. KPI number four, since we did this quickly, that is meeting dry matter intakes after calving. And again, that's going to be important because transition cows, by definition, is basically uh, 21 days before calving, 20 days after calving. And in many farms, there is a specific fresh cow ration to help these cows transition well. Uh, we really got to get energy into these cows. This is a slide that comes from Penn State. This looks at energy balance. And here's your transition cows, three weeks before calving, three weeks after calving. And the bar simply says, how much energy balance do you experience during that time period? So zero means cows are not gaining weight, they're not losing weight, they're meeting their requirement. Now there's two things to see here, attendees. Number one, notice how this number keeps going on down, reflecting the lower dry matter intakes here and also a greater drive for energy for the colostrum and for the unborn calf. Notice here, that's what you want to avoid. I don't want my cows one week before calving losing body weight because now the liver deals with that. Over here, the mammary gland becomes a player uh, to handle that. But here comes the liver. Now the liver has to do something with that mobilized body fat. Look at here, folks, the first two weeks after calving. We are, we're down eight, roughly eight mcals of energy. That's roughly 0.35 mcals per pound of milk. Bingo, that's about 70, that's about 20 pounds of milk. This cow is going to have to take off her back, mobilize, or eat more dry matter. And so you can see again, somewhere around week five or six, we start to become positive energy balance. Do you think that has an impact on getting cows pregnant here at, uh, you know, at, at, at day 70 or 80? And Dr. James Britt, somebody recognize that name, says, yes, it does. Yes, it does. So these cows need to get the positive energy balance. You want to minimize this loss here. Paul Fricky has got some brand new data that says cows that maintain body weight are much more successful in getting pregnant as well. So this has got dry matter, right? These all have dry matters written all over it as far as that goes. So here's the guideline that comes from Dr. Al Kurtz. Some of you may know that name. He, uh, this data was done when he was working at Perina Mills, published in the Journal of Dairy Science. And it says, here are your dry matter intakes the first week to the fifth week after calving, here's your first lactation heifers, and here's your second lactation heifers. And so it's pretty obvious, heifers eat less, and the spread gets wider. So that's why we like to have the fresh heifers in a separate pen from the older cows, because they are gonna be somewhat limited in their competitiveness to consume dry matter intakes. So if you've got a fresh pen, this sucker, this slide is powerful. That's the one you want to circle. Because if you've got one of your computer programs, yes, four cows calved today if you're a big herd, then this number goes down. And so it's very fluid. No cows calved the last five days on your farm or seven days. Then basically, if you're at week two, now if no cows calved in. Now all those cows are at week three, assuming you took nothing out, uh, no cows out of the pen. Boy, I can't. This is an exciting slide for me. We use it all the time in our transition cow diets. Why could that be important? Dr. Dick Wallace, some of you will recognize that name from the University of Illinois, now in Zoetis, he took a bunch of our cows, about 23, and that's not very many. 
and we looked at the first 21 days. That's what this is. We day nine, day uh, day nine, day 19. Here's day 21. Here's my healthy cows. And these are Holstein cows at the University of Illinois. And you can see the nice increase that we get here. And this is kilograms. So if you go back to the previous slide, our red line is below the target. So we aren't quite getting where they should be. But now look, here are my cows that retain placenta and metritis in the green. These cows have uterine challenges. And look at, look what we're giving up. We're giving up nearly five kilos of dry matter. Huge. Guess where that bar graph is? Guess what kind of challenge these cows have? Here are your cows with the DA slash ketosis. 13 of those cows. These cows have metabolic challenges. Look at that. They're way, they're below the green line. And so the bad news is you come out 21 days and we're still giving up about five kilos of dry matter. That's really bad news. Now, if that doesn't excite you, then I say, let's look at milk production. And those are the same cows. So at day 21, my healthy cows at 90 pounds of milk. My cows that had a uterine problem are sitting at about 70 pounds of milk. And my cows, slightly over 60 pounds, that had metabolic challenges. Wow, I'm in your pocketbook. And then, of course, you've got all those metabolic risks that are associated with that. So that's KPIs number three and four. Any quick comments or concerns at this point? Hearing that. none. Hearing yeah. none. Everything's good. Everything's good. Let's go to KPI number five. Now, Daniel, if we don't get any questions, we're going to get done early here today as far as that goes. Heaven forbid. KPI number five, and that is strategic use of feed additives. And so here is my list. If I was consulting on your farm, I'd be looking at all the yeses. So I'd be feeding Romenzen, roughly 300 milligrams prepartum, 400 to 450 milligrams postpartum. I'd have yeast culture, very clear data. Biggest bang for your buck is transition cows out here. And the levels vary a little bit depending on which product you're using. Some companies have a more concentrated product than others. Propylene glycol, a great drench. You can't let these cows drink this stuff. This is a drench, roughly about, uh, about a pint here. Uh, and you can see I would be drenching that as a source of blood glucose. Calcium propionate, again, fairly unpalatable, has a strong odor associated with it. About a third of a pound, you might be able to fool them getting into cows at calving. Again, this ends up usually being drenched as well. I like calcium propionate because I bring propionate, that is my glucose pre precursor, as is propylene over here. And then I also get a very biologically available calcium. More, of, more about that on KPI number eight here in just a minute. So uh, these would be my drenched products. Generally speaking, I would use a combination of both. Many of the drenched products, more about that a bit later, will ask you to add the propylene glycol because this is a liquid and of course it's quite expensive. Penn State did some very nice research in which they were actually mixing in a two pound carrier, some propylene glycol and got some nice work done by Dr. Vargas there. Uh, they had, that's two pounds, I think they were using something like soy holes or beet pulp to carry it in. And uh, the research in Illinois, excuse me, Wisconsin says drenching propylene glycol is the way to go because you get a slug of glucose being produced by the liver, taking these products, and that causes insulin response and that drives down fat mobilization. So drenching propylene glycol clearly is the ideal way to go, which is better than putting it in the feed. But then again, putting in the feed is better than nothing at all. We have, a, Here's the, we have a question here. Yes. Um, with the reduced cost in fuel, the production of uh, is it glycerin, is, uh, the cost of that's gone down. And I've seen that on some of the farms. Uh, what's your comment on that product as a replacement for propylene glycol? Is it actually superior? I don't think a uh, great question. And then the best answer I can give Dan, Daniel is I don't know. But we do know that the, the, that the, the glycerol is a glucose precursor. And in a lactating ration, you can come up as high as 10%. That is some Purdue data. I have not seen anything in transition cows, but I'll bet you a piece of pie. Daniel, you know I bet a piece of pie. I usually don't lose on that. I think you can substitute it in. I don't think it's going to be superior. You can substitute it for propylene glycol, yes. Will it be superior to calcium propionate? I'll bet you a piece of pie. It's not because it doesn't bring the calcium. 
So if you can get the glycerol, now be careful, there's no contaminants with the glycerol. Uh, sometimes there's some methanol in there and that can really be a bugger on the liver of the cow. So make sure it is a feed grade glycerol. And I'm not sure if companies know that or not, but that's, uh, or, or uh, plants that are producing uh, uh, the bio, uh, biodiesel, but be, care, be, be sure it is fairly, it's, it's not having contaminants in it that's gonna cause some problems with the cow. So I think the answer is yes, you could probably use propylene glycol on a glucose equivalent base. And now don't even ask me a question. You'll have to ask some real smart chemist or biochemist or, or, or a nutritionist on that. Uh, I'm not sure you can substitute it um, you know, 100 milliliters for 100 milliliters. Just don't know, the, don't know the chemical structure of it as far as that goes. Great question, great question. Whoever asked that question gets another cup of coffee. There's a, there's a comment along with that. I mean, it's been marketed just with the label of what it is. There's absolutely nothing else on it. So I think your uh, caution about uh, added elements to it, I think are very well taken. And uh, that gives me something to go with. And okay, I, very good. I have, never, I have never won a piece of pie from you, uh, so I, I don't expect you today. <laughs> <laughs> Just eyes wide open. Don't, don't get me wrong with that. I mean, uh, the same thing applies to urea. People say, can I use fertilizer grade urea? And the answer is no, because we're not sure what else contaminants, heavy metals might be with it. Not a problem putting in the soil, but it could be a problem putting in your cow and popping up in the milk. Uh, I don't think there's anything in the, in the glycerol that's going to cause a milk residue problem. But the question is if there'd be some other things in the elements there that could affect liver function or cow health as far as that goes. So great comments. Well, great, uh, where we go. Uh, here's a new kid on the block, chromium. We just added that to our la yes list. So Daniel, you wouldn't have seen this when you took our class two years ago. We've had chromium here and that's 0.5 parts per million. That one is controlled by FDA and that is organic. It's a it's a produced by Kemen, not that I make any money on it. That's the only game in town. Kemen, you can't get that from Alltech. You cannot get it from uh, Zimpro. The only approved one is the uh, propionate complex chromium, and that's controlled by FDA. The anionic products in blue, you can see these are as needed. So if you need uh, a biochlor or soy chlor or animate, it depends on how much potassium you've got in the ration. I want to get the DCAD down below 50 a milli equivalents. That's very farm specific. If you do that, you must run urine pHs because we got a problem, came in from a European nutritionist in which their urine pHs were under five and they thought they were buggering up the colostrum. Well, I think they'll bugger up the liver, I mean, excuse me, the kidney, uh, as well as colostrum quality. We got that going to our researcher right now. Don't know that answer, thought we might have it for today, but we don't. Room protected choline, if you tend to have fatty livers, a high level of ketosis, certainly 15 grams of protected choline. This would be 60 grams of bulk hems, reassure. Uh, that's the most common common U.S. product here, it's got some great research behind it. So again, if you've got cows that have on the edge of ketosis, with excessive fat mobilization, this tends to move the uh, fat out of the liver as phospholipids, out it goes. Uh, niacin, we'd like to have that, uh, half that rumen protected, and there are several companies now producing rumen protected niacin. We want to get it past the bacteria. The other, other half is raw, and that's because the rumen microbes can use the niacin to stimulate production or performance as well. And again, uh, so, and again, it's on my boo list because if body conditions are over three, five or greater, heavy cows, niacin, as in rats and in dogs and humans, it shuts down fat mobilization. So that becomes pretty important as well. The direct fed microbes, these are bacteria. We just don't know which product, which microbes and how many are needed. So we're watching this one very carefully. If you want to learn more about probiotics, go to the Hordes Dairyman webinar I presented about a year ago, and we have a whole half hour of direct fed microbials on there as well. You can take a look at that. Okay, well, that was kind of a, that's one of the hot topics. Uh, we had one night, great question. Daniel, anything else to the cause? Well, I guess I would wonder, what, can you tell us a little bit more about the chromium? I Yes, okay, the chromium. The chromium, and we could actually give you a whole 20-minute uh, talk on that if you want. Chromium basically increases blood glucose. It also appears to increase insulin sensitivity. So you're really working, looking at the energetics of glucose to the cow. And that, of course, has got ketosis 
written all over it. It also reduces NEFA, non esteric fatty acid. That is what's in the blood when cows lose body weight. That's what your liver has to deal with that. And either the mammary gland can take that NEFA and make it into butter fat, which means now you have a high testing cow in the first two weeks after calving, and that cow is signaling to you she is really moving butter fat out. If the mammary gland doesn't deal with it, then other tissues, it goes to the liver, and the liver can make ketones body, ketone bodies out of it, or it can actually make a, a, a fatty liver. In, in, in there. So because the NEFAs are reduced, we see higher dry matter intakes, and Daniel, now you know the rest of the story, you get more milk. Now there's also some new research coming out of Europe and the U.S. showing some improvement in reproductive performance, which has dry matter and energy written all over it as well, and maybe heat stress. That one's a little tougher to uh, probably dot the I's across the T's on. But chromium is a, uh, a trace mineral. Uh, fed up almost about twice the level of selenium. So we're not using a scoop shovel here. It has to be a certain valence. Uh, I think it's a valence four, but anyway, don't quote me on that. And, uh, and so that's why the FDA is involved. It's gotta be the right kind of chromium. Otherwise it can be uh, a real problem for livestock as far as that goes. That's kind of how the story, I don't know, I can show you the data. Significant improves, increases in, uh, in lowering blood nephas, dry, increased dry matter intakes, and that leads to more milk. And those three are all connected very nicely as well. Anything else you'll do the cost? Nope, that's good, thanks. Okay, let's go on to dredging. This goes up pretty quickly. This is one that creates all kinds of excitement. Here you can see this is a McGrath uh, drench here, uh, a drench make. Those are the two most popular pumps out there. That pump will be on, on the pail. And so it's kind of a, a frees up one of your hands. Uh, notice that we've got the holes very nicely positioned there, usually with a nose lead here. And they've all extended the length of these tubes now because they don't want the cow to be able to bring the liquid back up or drown the cow in the lungs because that'll kill them. That will kill them. When I give this talk, I find four groups and we have people voting out there. Uh, we've got a... Um, uh, response here of one group one says we believe they drench every cow uh, I'm not sure we need to do that uh, group two that's the winner right there uh, group two simply says a selected cow that's based on age a lactation number history meaning if she had twins if she didn't clean if she had milk fever we had some of those kind of things and a cow that history for example of a ketosis and fatty liver these are at risk cows I'd be drenching those cows right at calving the third group is, well, we drench cows only to fix a problem. That's too late. You know, it's kind of like buying fire insurance today and the barn burnt down yesterday. I'm sorry. Good idea, but you were a day late. And, of course, here's what I run into. Are you nuts, Hutchins? I would never do that. It's too expensive. Yes. Five to seven to ten dollars for a package of drenched product. It is too dangerous. Yes, I can drain the cow. I can kill the cow. And number three, you got to be handsome like me, being a big guy, because I tell you, you grab a head of the cow to get out and put that tube down. You too can have some real excitement to take some real labor. Why would some people do every cow? Because they don't want to miss one. And I had a very good dairy in Illinois. I said, I'm not sure my staff in the maternity pen can identify selected cows. So rather than take that chance, rather than missing one cow that may die or become a broken cow, we're just going to drench them all. And then you can re-drench again 12 hours later, but you drench it at a much lower volume of water. We're looking at 10 gallons of water carrying product. So that is what we call a power drench. We're looking at 10 gallons. Once in a while, I'll run to herds, I have 15 gallons. Why would you want 15 gallons of, of water going in? And the answer is water is roughly eight pounds. And uh, so I'm, I'm, putting in and I'm putting in 120 pounds of water in the rumen of this cow. And trust me, the rumen is going to come down and that's going to block the displaced abomasum or the movement of the abomasum around as far as that goes. You can also go what we call a caulking gun. Uh, that would be like pints or might even be a paste. As far as that goes, I'm sure I'd call that dredging, I'd call it pasting as far as that goes, and, uh, and away we go. Uh, to me, the real power is the water. I want to rehydrate the cow. So I think that's really important. In fact, when I grew up on our farm, my dad made me carry two five-gallon buckets of warm water into the calving pen when the cow had his calf, and the cow would normally suck that right down. Now, the question is, what'd you put in with it? We had, my dad had nothing in there. I would put a glucose precursor in there. Uh, that could be uh, calcium propionate. You might have to put a little milk replacer to, hey, to, to hide the taste of it there. Definitely electrolytes. 
potassium chloride sodium, because these, these cows, fresh cows have lost during the calving process some of these fluids here. And if you've got uh, a rumen stimulus, that could be a yeast product, uh, that could be amino acid, that could be a probiotic, uh, could be alfalfa meal, but I don't like alfalfa meal. It's green. And everybody likes to see a drench product that's green because you've got alfalfa in it. And as one farmer says, all that does is plug my pump. Exactly right. I'd let the cow eat a half a pound of good quality hay rather than grind it up, put it into a, a drench gun and try to drench my cows here. If you've got an off-feed cow, then rumen fluid is a real magic. We had one herd, I think, it still does here in Illinois, and a 600 cow dairy herd, and they have one donor cow. She has a rumen fistula in it. So when a cow gets sick, they suck out a gallon a room and fluid drenching the, the sick cow and away they go. And again, if you redrench, instead of the 10 gallons up here, you're probably gonna redrench with maybe two, two and a half gallons, a much smaller volume, but probably the same product. This recipe comes from Iowa State University. I got it from Dr. Jesse Goff several years ago. And so you can see what it is. Uh, here comes your uh, glucose precursor, a pound of calcium propionate. If you want to, you can do a half a pound of calcium propionate and 500 milliliters of propylene glycol. You can do that as well. My yeast culture and rumen stimulant here. Here's my electrolytes, potassium chloride and salt down here. A source of magnesium, not electrolyte, but a source of magnesium. Sulfur comes into your play. And if your veterinarian does a blood sample and the cows are low on phosphate, you could add some sodium uh, sodium phosphate in here. These have to be very water soluble, of course, to make sure they stay in solution. You can go out and buy some products uh, up and over uh, is, uh, is one example. My point is, if you're using a drench product commercially, compare what's in the bag to what's on this list. And you should be able to back into that to see exactly what you're drenching. You can also go to a drinkable drench. This is not caught on very big. A couple of companies in the Midwest went with it and they prepackaged this. And so they put a flavoring agents in there to try to make encourage the cow to do it. And of course, it has to be very water soluble if it's a drinkable drench. Otherwise, it's all sitting on the bottom of your, uh, of your pail as far as that goes. Uh, one of my Amish guys said, well, you could just sprinkle that on the back of a calf. And when the cow licks the calf, she licks the electrolytes. And the answer is yes, they do, but I didn't get the water. And I think water is keen and clear at this point. KPI number seven, we're gonna keep right going. I'll pick any questions up at the end. A good solid trace mineral program is critical. I recommend at least a third to a quarter of, of the zinc being organic and uh, copper uh, at that level. All the selenium is organic because it's more biological available. Uh, on this one, didn't get there. Uh, should be all of the chromium would be organic as well. Those are our levels for vitamin A, D, and E at the various parts of the transition diet. These are the milligrams of actual trace minerals that you are adding, and here you can see chromium pops up here. So you're saying, how good is my transition mineral pack? And I would say if you said you're feeding a tenth of a pound of a mineral pack and it's delivering these milligrams, yeah, someone's got to sit and figure that out or your computer will do it for you if you quote it incorrectly. If you've got these kinds of numbers, in addition to whatever is coming from your forages and your grains, hooray for you, hooray for you. I think you've got a good trace mineral program. And notice the stars, copper, selenium, chromium, and zinc are all starred, which means that they should be from part or all from organic sources. In, a, in the milk cow ration, instead of all of this, uh, uh, the, the, we'd add another three or four milligrams, that would be inorganic, primarily because of economics as far as that goes. KPI number eight, I mean, we're in pretty good shape, we're keeping around and going though. This one's really important, so wake up, wake up, here comes the new stuff, maintaining blood calcium levels. We call that avoiding hypo, meaning below, calcemia, which is low blood calcium. And what do we mean by that? Well, it simply says that calving, that's time zero. This data all comes from Gary Etzel at the University of Wisconsin and just had an article in Progressive Dairyman. If you want to read that, it's there as well. Here at day zero, here is a cow without milk fever and here's a cow with milk fever. So that's why the cow goes down. Blood calcium gets too low and calcium is critical for basically uh, uh, for muscle contraction and allow the cow to stay in. Now, what's the critical number? And according to Dr. Gary Etzel, it is 8.6 total plasma calcium milligrams per deciliter. And there are some companies and universities trying to come up with a cow side test, which you'll see in ketosis here in the next PowerPoint or the next KPI, trying to get a cow side test on that. Some veterinary clinics can do this for you. You take blood samples in for some of your fresh cows, see where they're at. So you can see these cows are hypocalcemic. 
meaning low blood calcium. Why could that be important? Number one, it affects uterine contraction. The cow may not calve or she may not clean. Number two, it affects the digestive tract, may affect dry matter intake. Number three, it can affect teeth sphincter, and that is your barrier to bacteria entering the mammary gland. So pretty important, as we would say. So certainly, uh, these are some of the research from Wisconsin. You can see when you have low blood calcium, the risk of mass, um, um, uh, uterine infections is threefold. Now you know why. Uh, milk fever is simply a matter of degree. If, if, we, if they don't stop, the cow can't kick in. And then we also can see some effects on dry matter intake and reproduction. And here's the big one. Low blood calcium affects the immune system. And that means the number of uh, neutrophils, that is your. That is gonna be your attack white blood cells here, and then the ability to phagostize, which means to attack and engulf those bacteria. And let me tell you folks, this immune suppression is huge in a transition cow. Then you put hypocalcemia on it, and you might as well get the drugs out, get the vet out, because you're gonna have some challenges with that cow. So what are you gonna do about this? We're gonna look at uh, uh, using the DCAD, that's another talk for another day. And so you can see here, uh, uh, by you going to a DCAD, what does DCAD do? It corrects for high potassium, which appears to have a negative impact on the parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid hormone is the hormone that regulates blood calcium. And that appears to be sluggish or not as reactive as it could be if you got mass levels of potassium. And so you can see what happens with, with DCAD. And then this is the home run. Uh, about a third of my dairymen now are giving a oral calcium bolus at calving. This is the most common one, BovaCalc. That's a company we are not recommending. There are a number of different boluses out there, and you can see what happens here. Two comments on the calcium bolus. Check to see if you're delivering enough calcium. Let me see, I think. We, uh, here it is, make sure you are, you're getting at least 50 to 55 grams of calcium and make it available calcium. And these are the good guys, the calcium chloride, calcium propionate, calcium sulfate. There could be some other ones as well, but some of these are, notice the word limestone is not there. And so if I'm gonna be looking at limestone at seven or eight cents a pound, and I'm gonna look at calcium propionate at 80 cents a pound, trust me, I know which one. If I'm gonna make some money on you, I know what I'm gonna put in my boluses as far as that goes. Be well aware, most farmers are picking up on this. This blood, the calcium from the bowls clears in five to eight hours. So if the cow still looks sluggish and rest his soul, my dad could always see this on cows. He'd look at a cow and he says, dad, he said, son, go call the vet. This cow is gonna go down. And so the vet would come out and treat this cow that was hypocalcemic, he could see it. But basically if this cow after 12 hours is still sluggish, I would go in with a second bowl to see. And what we're trying to do is get the cow to turn on her calcium mechanism, which means what? Absorbing calcium from the diet, assuming dry matter intakes are there, and number two, reabsorption of calcium from the bone. And of course, that works very well on young cows, but in older cows, the bone is not nearly as mobilizable. I'm not sure that's a name, a word there, Daniel. KPI number nine, and we're in good shape here. Uh, we only got two more to go, and they're, they're modestly short. KPI number nine, simply looks at blood ketone levels. And this is uh, very popular in the larger herds based on the data that came from New York and from Wisconsin. This is a very large field study, uh, and uh, Dr. Nystrom at Cornell, Dr. Etzel at Wisconsin, they looked at these four big herds, very good producing herd. You would say these are fine, Holstein herds as far as that goes, producing high levels of milk production. What we find here now is, how, what, what did the farmers say? What did they see? And so you can see in these herds, some of them were very good at seeing it, others very poor. If you measure that, and that was using the beta hydroxybutyric acid, using the cut point of 1.2 millimolar per liter with, with a precision extra meter, we'll show a picture of that. And that was happening at day five after calving, you can see 40, 27, 40, 57%, almost 60% of the cow. And look what, look what we're seeing. Uh, this, uh, this herdsman was quite good at it. He was seeing half of them. This guy, this herd person, this individual only seeing 10% of them as far as that goes. And so what's happening now, most of the DHI centers now are testing fresh cow milk for beta hydroxybutyric acid. So that's a a really neat breakthrough. The Canadians were several years ahead of us in the US doing that as well. Dr. Assel estimates 30% of the cows 
are at risk of this, and that is not uh, on the low blood calcium. Uh, heifers should not experience that first lactation cows. All cows here, because that's got dry matter written all over it here. We know it impacts milk yield and reproduction. That's the cut point. You can use this equipment here, Precision Extra. It's the same meter that you and I use for blood glucose. If you're over 70 years of old and are nervous about your blood glucose level, you're gonna check these cows for the first 30 days after calving. They say three to 16 DHI is testing for the first fresh cows on the herd. And if you're gonna find them, what are you gonna do? Uh, bingo, you're gonna drench the cow with propylene glycol until her until she goes below this cut point. And they may even have to drench her two or three or four times. Usually you drench them uh, at each milking when you're doing that. Here is your device. Very simple, this little strip, about two and a half, three dollars. I think they're back in production. They were out of production for a while. And you can see it's using whole blood. You're taking a drop of uh, blood, usually out of the tail head of the cow. That's the easiest way not to get killed doing that. And what you're getting here, this cow uh, here would be uh, a 1.05. Uh, if this is uh, measuring the here, this would be a 1.05, she would be okay. It was 1.35, she would be suspect. KPI number 10. And I, I think this is a, I, I think our cows are suffering on this because we have Donald Trump as president. They're all stressed out uh, with the Russians. But anyway, we'll move on. Okay, that's supposed to be humorous. I can't see all, can't see any, any expressions here. That's the only problem. I cannot read my people. What do you mean reducing stress? Well, certainly stress hormones can really cause metabolic and dry matter problems as well. So here is Dr. Drakeley's list for reducing stress. Less than 90% of the stocking rate in the close-up pen. So if you have 30 beds, then theoretically you should never have more than about 26, 27 dry cows in there. And you need to have about 30 inches of spunk space right down to three feet. Actually, the Wisconsin people say 30 inches is enough space for a pregnant cow. Jerseys wouldn't be quite as big. He's suggesting three feet of bunk space for each cow. Uh, be sure the animal understands how to use lockups. I've seen that on some farms. Heifers come in and go, how do I get to the feed? I am putting my head through that hole there. And be sure they understand how to use waterers, especially if they're drinking cups. Understand that. We had to train our cows here at the University of Illinois. Someone had to take a stick, hold it down, and all of a sudden the cows figured out if you held down that paddle, there was water there. Avoid excessive pen movements. We're saying these pens should stay stable at least for 10 to 12 days to be removing cows in a close-up pen. If they're gonna calve in less than 10 or 12 days, you probably should not move them. Leave them in the far off pen because what will happen, they'll drop in dry matter intake. Ideally, big herds separate the close-up and the, and the fresh cows and, and mature cows, heifers and timid cows over here. When you make ration changes, when you're stepping up from the far off, close up, fresh, high cow, and that's a very common step up program on many farms here in the Midwest, avoid major changes, 10% of the nutrient concentration. So if my far off dry cow program is uh, 13%, my close-up is 15%, my fresh cow is gonna probably be like 18 or 15, a higher percent, you know what I mean by slower, and that's really important with fiber and starch. Probably not quite as important as protein or minerals, but really important for fiber and starch to avoid any rumen dysfunction. Avoid sorting, that's why you gotta put water in there and, uh, and feed selectivity here, and of course, you gotta manage heat stress. The new work from Florida says, You've got to cool close-up dry cows and fresh cows. The close-up dry cows will end up being give you more milk, a larger calf, and will not have a negative effect on the female calf that's in the uterus of that animal. And with that, Daniel, we're done. We have got uh, roughly five minutes or get ready to warm up the next one or people need to get a cup of coffee or go to the restroom if they're my age. Uh, any other questions or comments? And we've gone through the 10 KPIs. Uh, it could be fun to pick which is your favorite one. Uh, I, would, uh, I would pick mine would be the minerals. I think the trace minerals program is so critical for immunity and animal health. It would be great fun to say which, which one would you have. A few farmers might pick stress as being their favorite one. Daniel, I'll stop talking and let you in. So Ken, you had a question. Well, back to the uh, rumen uh, drenching, especially on the off-feed cows. Yes. Um, I've seen some benefit, I think, to giving an IV with hypertonic saline in an effort to um, you know, create an osmotic gradient to actually pull that, that fluid that you're putting, uh, that 10 gallons, actually bring it in the bloodstream. 
do you think that I'm just uh, fooling myself or could you, uh, or am, am I wasting my time? Well, the, the, the easy answer is I have no data to answer that question. So that, that's the easy answer, but I think you're spot on. I think I, I think if you perceive uh, better rehydration of the cow and better uh, better health, uh, I would be monitoring such things as uh, dry matter intake, uh, rumen fill on the cow. In other words, you know that's another thing that is the cow starting to get the, filling that that big void on on the left side of the cow. So I I, I think uh, uh, I, I think you're spot on, but I have no research that I can find or I can, that I've seen. Daniel, maybe you have that would say. That's a, that's a home run. But if it looks like it's working for you, you're right. It will pull it will pull fluids in. Now I'd be nervous if I wasn't giving my water drench with it, because now you're going to you're going to try to pull that water out of the digestive uh, tract at some point, you know, and that could really cause some some interesting problems in terms of rumen fluid and fluidity and flushing. I think that's another big plus of of the the, of the water. Uh, the 10 gallons of water, and that is you flush the rumen. So that literally gets say, things moving again. And uh, that, that's always a plus. Yeah, I'm in 100% agree with you on that, Mike, because uh, 20 years ago, we were giving just the hypertonic saline, and of course that triggers the thirst center on the cow, and then, she, and then you put a couple uh, buckets in front of the, the fresh cow, just like you, your father had you do. And uh, I would notice they would put their head in the bucket and they drink about half the bucket, uh, and they, they didn't really finish all 10 gallons like you really like them to do. Uh, and we've done a lot better since we actually started administering those cells. Okay. And that is a hyp hypotonic, right? Hyper. 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 I'm sorry. Hyper, which means that the, the, that's high, high, in salt, high in salt concentration, and the, 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 the cow's body, or your body, would try to... to uh, to maintain uh, osmolality balance in the bloodstream. Great comment, great comment. We learned something, Jim. We learned something. Anything else? It's always good to learn something. It's always good to learn something. Any other comments, questions, clarification? I know I used my whole time.